So as I mentioned earlier on, we want to look at communication media of computer networks today. So perhaps maybe we'd like to start with what is communication media? Okay, what is communication media? How would you understand this term communication media? Simply put, communication media refers to the message carrier, how the message moves from one point to the other point, and the carrier that carries the message from point A to point B is what you call the communication media. So now, this communication media comes in two types. Okay, the card of the message comes in two types. There is what you call wireless media, and there is what you call wired media. So basically, we've got two types of communication media when it comes to computer networks. There is wired media, and also there is wireless media. Okay. So let us begin with wired media. Let us begin with the wired media. So wired media, basically, we are talking about the communication channel, which is tangible, which is physical, and is able to ensure connectivity from point A to point B by means of tangible uh, material. Now, this tangible material in computer network, we normally use copper. Copper is the best tangible communication media that we use in data communication when it comes to wired media. Now, this copper is divided into two. This copper is divided into two types. There's what you call coaxial cable, coaxial cable, and there's what you call twisted pair cables. So once again, there's coaxial cable and twisted pair cables. Now, this coaxial cable again, if you look at it, we have two types also. It branches into two. There's what you call thick, thick net cable, and there's what you call thin, thin net cable. Okay. So thick net and also thin net. Basically, these are abbreviations. The full names are thick ethernet, thick ethernet. Then this other one is thin ethernet. Okay. So when we go to twisted pair cable, also twisted pair cable is also divided into two. There is what you call shielded twisted pair, and there's what you call unshielded twisted pair. Okay, so now I was looking at twisted pair cable now. Also, twisted pair cable has also two branches, just like coaxial cable has two branches. There's thick net cable and there's also thin net. Now, the twisted pair cable also has two branches, two types. There's shielded twisted pair, which we call STP, and there is unshielded twisted pair, which we call UTP. So now these two categories of copper wire, which are used in networking, they, they serve two different purposes, okay? When it comes to data communication. But eventually the objective, the overall objective is to carry data on the medium. Now, what purpose does coaxial cable serve? Why do you have a coaxial cable? If you have a DSTV at all, madam, or go TV, that cable which comes from the dish to the decoder is the best example of a coaxial cable. 
if you open okay that cable you remove the jacket and the insulator you find that there's only one copper wire inside it basically cables as we know them they've got two cables or three inside them live neutral even ethnic but this coaxial cable has only one copper wire inside it and also if you remember those vcr the video cassette recorders those there was that cable which was going to the tv and also the the vcr that single cable again that single cable is an example of a coaxial cable again if you open it you only find one copper wire inside it so now what is the reason why this cable only have one copper wire inside why not having two the reason is to avoid what you call crosstalk to avoid what you call crosstalk or interference when there are two cables inside and they run in parallel together in the same jacket there will be interference signals will move, will move from one cable one wire to another wire and vice versa in this way there will be what you call interference or crosstalk so the scientists have discovered that running one copper wire inside will avoid interference and the data will be transmitted without any disturbances this can be so damaging when you are transmitting what you call digital signals that is the ones and the zeros okay if you are transmitting digital signals any interference if a one changes to a zero and the zero changes to a one, then the whole message is dropped, is distorted. Okay. That's why if you have observed at home, if for DSTV, the digital transmission, if there is interference, for example, there's like any night, it's raining. What happens to the signal? It disappears completely. You won't see anything, it's just a signal loss. Because digital transmission does not need interference. It does not work well with noise because it distorts the whole message. But if you remember the time that we are transmitting analog signals in Zambia for, for our broadcasting TV, we can even see, even if there is too much noise interference, we can see some pictures, but of course they'll be not so clear because analog can withstand interference. It's very strong. Now, digital cannot survive, cannot survive the interference. That's why the coaxial cable, to ensure that there's no interference so that the message can be distorted, you only run one copper wire inside. Okay? Now, why do we have thick net and thin net when it comes to this cable? Why having two? The, the, the answer is just simply distance and the usage. If you're going to need a long distance, you're going to connect two different buildings or two different branches separated geographically, you need to have a thick net connecting these cables. So a thick net is good for long distance transmission. And why is it thick? You know, the way the coaxial cable is, what you see outside that black plastic is the jacket, right? Now, once you remove that jacket, you find that white plastic inside. We call it insulator. Okay, we call it insulator. So, when the, the insulator is removed, okay, when the insulator is removed, you find now there is that copper wire inside. It. Okay, so with the thick net, Inside the insulator, there is a wire mesh. Okay, there is additional protection inside it. How to get? Now, this protection is the one that offers more protection as data travels long distance. Okay, and then the thick net has no mesh inside it. Okay, because it is just used locally within the building. How to get? So. If you look at the two cables, if you look at the two cables, they all serve the same purpose, but in terms of distance, we 
use different ones. The long distances, we use thick net. The short distances within the same building, we use the thin net. Otherwise, both of them, they were designed to avoid crosstalk and they were designed to actually save digital signals very well. Okay, so what is the application of coaxial cable? Which network topology applies the coaxial cable? Remember last time we discussed network topologies and then after discussing all these topologies, we also looked at diagrams. I also gave you an assignment to, to research on the diagrams that I used. I believe by this time you have done that already. So now, if you look at those diagrams that you have, okay, the best application for this is the bus topology. Okay, the bus topology is the one that makes use of what? Makes use of this cable. Remember, there is a cable that Okay, runs from one terminator to the other terminator. And all the computers are attached to this cable. It's a shared cable, right? All the computers are attached to this cable. Now it is this cable which we call bus, is one that is of type coaxial. Okay, so we use the coaxial cable as we connect the computers to each other via, okay, this so-called shared cable bus. Okay, so that's the main purpose why the buckshot cable were designed in this way. Basically, avoid interference and also they're good for digital transmission. Okay, now let's look at twisted pair cable. Okay, if you look at this cable, inside this cable, you find so many cables, probably eight color coded cables are uh, in this jacket, okay? The wires are about eight, okay, color coded. Now if you look at uh, what you have discussed earlier on, when the cables are in the same jacket, they cross talk, they interfere with each other, okay? So now, how does this cable avoid interference? Because there are more than, here, there are more than what? Two cables, basically eight of them, Okay, so now the science behind this, because even this cable, even if it has so many cables inside it, it also avoids interference. How does it avoid interference, right? Remember the twisting of cables makes the cables to be arranged in what you call perpendicular manner. Okay, perpendicular manner at 90 degrees to each other. And the rules of physics, of course, uh, allows okay the cables to be put in this manner without interfering with each other. So now, when the cables are in perpendicular manner, they cannot interfere because they're not put in parallel. So that's the concept that they use: twist the cables so that they won't interfere. Okay. So now, this twisting also helps to avoid interference and also helps. Uh, the data transfer to be very, very high. Okay, that's why most computers, as we speak, most networks, we choose wire transmission. They all use the twisted pair cables because they've got high bandwidth. The transmission of data is also very good because there's so many cables inside it. Again, this twisted pair cable is also divided into two. There's what to call STP and UTP. Basically, almost the same reason with the quadrant. The reason why we've got these uh, demarcations or these branches is basically distance, okay, or the coverage. So the STP, the shielded twisted pair cables, they cover a long distance as opposed to unshielded twisted pair cables. Because then they don't cover a long distance and they're quite flexible. They are just used within the organization buildings. Okay, again, at your own time, I encourage you to look up the diagrams on the internet. Look up the diagrams for these cables I've discussed, the copper wire. And then also look at the quadruple cable and also look at the twisted pair, twisted pair cables. 
see how this looks like the cross section and also the horizontal section. Okay. Now that is wired media, which is copper. Now let's look at the wireless media. So the wireless media, of course, is the media or the channel that is intangible, the card of the message, which is intangible, All right? So now, basically, we are talking about airwaves, okay? The airwaves are the ones that carries what? That carries data in this regard. Now, these airwaves, not all the airwaves are safe for use for human beings. Right? Others are very amorphous. So because of that, other airwaves are not used. Others are used. Now, what helps scientists to determine if at all these waves can be used and these can be used? So they are to split the airwaves, okay? There's what you call electrospectrum, okay? Electrospectrum division. So this helped the scientists to divide the airwaves into seven waves. Okay, of which the first one is radio waves. The second one is microwaves. The third one is infrared. The fourth one is visible light. The fifth one is ultra violent rays. The sixth one is X-rays. And the seventh one is gamma, gamma rays. Okay, so now when you move from one to seven going down, what do you increase? You increase the energy, the speed, and also you increase the, the levels of harm. I would give. Increasing energy, the speed and the frequency, this is good for data transmission, but also increasing the levels of harm. That's where the problem is. Okay, which means starting from five going down, these waves are very harmful to human beings. What are these waves? We are talking about the ultraviolet rays, the UVs, the X rays. Okay, and the gamma rays. These are extremely harmful to human beings, but they're very good when it comes to data transmission because they've got high energy, they've got high speed, and the frequencies are very high and they can penetrate obstacles. So if we are to use these starting from five to seven, we, are, we can have actually data connectivity or two people communicating uh, with a very large, large, distance separating them okay without any support in between these supporters we see in between these communication towers they also serve the purpose of boosting the signal in case it loses strength but if what use the signal starting from five to seven you will discover that these boosters in between will be reduced and the speed imagine the speed that you can have if what use the gamma rays to communicate with our cell phones. So now the only drawback is these can kill humans or living organisms are very harmful. For example, the, the, the gamma rays causes cancer, the cancer virus. X-rays, they penetrate the bones, okay? And they actually cause impotence and someone can become barren because of these uh, rays. So they are not so good to human beings. So the only waves that are acceptable and that can be used to communicate are the first four. Radio waves, the microwave, infrared, and the visible light. More especially the radio waves are the most least harmful waves that you can use without Problems. But of course, they are least, I'm not saying they're not um, they are least, which means the effect can be seen some many, many years later. But we can live with that also. After all, we only live 70 to 80 years. Eh? 
<laughs> so humans can actually deal with this because the effects are not immediate. Okay, so many, many years. Okay, that's why you can see the effect later on. Yeah, so these are what we consider to be wireless media. The first four, the radio waves, the micro, infrared, and the visible light. So all our phones, the Wi-Fi, okay, the Wi-Fi technology uses radio waves. The WiMAX uses microwaves. All our gadgets inside our homes, like uh, remote controls, okay, we use infrared for our remote also. So as we speak at the moment, the only recommended uh, airwaves for communication are on the first four, radio waves, microwave, infrared, and also visible light. Visible light has okay, become very, very popular because of speed. If you have read these so-called optic fibers, eh? the optic fibers, the optic fibers uses visible light. They use visible light, the optic fibers. Because the light, as we know, travels very fast. So now if we can use light to transfer data, we can have very high speed internet and network connectivity. So most companies who have gone fiber, they enjoy the speed. So as we speak, most organizations, they prefer using uh, visible light to transfer data because of speed and energy. These others from five, six, seven, they're using other fields, medical fields, okay, and other fields which does not involve uh, human beings direct contact with human beings all the time, like the nuclear power stations, so on and so forth. Then they use these rays to produce or generate power. Okay. Maybe as we advance in science and technology, maybe there will be a way where we can use this without harming us. Because scientists are working day and night to find solutions to things that we perceive as very difficult at the moment. So to summarize what you have discussed under wire, I mean communication media, we have looked at two types. There's wireless media and there's wired media. Now under wired media, we have considered copper to be the most used wired media. And this copper is divided into two, the coaxial cables and the twisted pair cables. The twisted pair cables are divided into two, subdivided into two. There's shielded twisted pair and there's unshielded twisted pair. And the coaxial cable is also divided into, into two, the thick net and the thick net. The differences between these two subdivisions is the coverage, okay? The distance they cover. In our operations, we use thin. For the twisted pair in house operations, we use uh, unshielded. Long distances for coaxial, it is thick net. Long distances for twisted pair cables, it is shielded twisted pair cables. Now, one thing that I didn't mention is the application of twisted pair cables. And for the coaxial, we said it is used in bus topology. Right. Now, what about the twisted pair cables? Which topology uses twisted pair cables? It is the star topology, the most famous topology in the world. Okay, it, the star topology. So if you look at most of these devices that the, the star topology uses, the switch, okay, the router, the cables that goes there are the twisted pair cables. As we speak, it's the most used topology in the world, if not replacing all these other topologies that are variable when it comes to network. And then the wireless media, the best application, okay, where are these uh, medias popularly used? It is used in what you call cellular 
cellular networking our phones eh? our cell phones cellular networking that's where wireless communication is used i know many people when you say cell or cellular they think of our mobile phones eh? these are mobile stations our phones are mobile stations now why are they referred to uh, to cellular because if you look at uh, the network they form okay these towers the towers that you see mtn towers zamtel towers eh? these zamtel towers they form an area around it okay this area around a tower a base transceiver station is called a cell you have seen that eh? so where the tower is the area around it the coverage of that the footage of that tower is called the cell that's how come sometimes if you are in between the towers and then you are outside the base tower cell you are outside then you find that there is no network people say where i am there is no network because you're not in the cell of the tower so that's why you have to follow where the tower is so it can get into its cell and communicate okay so because of this okay because of this arrangement we call these cell cellular networks and most of the time our mobile stations are the ones that are connected to cellular networks that's why they are called cell phones right otherwise even a tablet even uh, a laptop can actually make use of the cell network or cellular networks how do you otherwise the technical name for our phones is a mobile station these are our mobile phones okay they are called cell phones because they belong to a cellular network most of the time is that clear okay good so the wireless media okay its best application is in the cellular networks okay so let's move on if that is clear we have discussed the wireless media now let's look at the telecommunication components okay the telecommunication what components let's discuss the components that are used in telecommunication or networks we have components or devices such as repeater we have a bridge we have a switch we have a router and we can talk about the publics okay of course there are so many that are being designed as we speak but let's talk about these five devices to get the concept of telecommunication to start with why are these devices okay why what was okay why do we design why are these devices designed? You have a text message. they were designed for this term we are calling attenuation mostly okay they were designed because of this term called attenuation so attenuation basically is a term that we, we use uh, when referring to signal loss okay when the signal moves from the source it moves okay for a particular distance after that particular distance a signal loses strength okay it cannot move anymore okay now when the signal loses strength and it drops we call that as signal attenuation okay now since we need signals to move very long distances regardless of this attenuation so because of that we need them to move very far we have designed these devices to boost so the main reason these devices are there is to boost a network if a network loses strength their main job is to boost a signal okay besides other functionalities that have come in which we we'll discuss later on but mostly these signals they boost a signal when it attenuates 
So now let's look at the repeater. As the name suggests, the repeater. A repeater is a telecommunication device with many ports, okay? And its main purpose is to amplify or repeat a signal so that it can cover a very long distance. Okay, that's the main purpose of the repeater, is to amplify a signal so that it can cover a long distance. Now, one weakness about a repeater, it does not control network traffic. A repeater does not control network traffic. Its main purpose is just amplify the signal. That's the main purpose of the repeater is to just amplify the signal. So because of this limitation of not controlling the network uh, traffic, a bridge was introduced. Okay, a bridge was introduced to control the network traffic. Now, one weakness of a bridge, it has limited the ports. When I say ports, I'm referring to the channels okay the communication channels in and out of a device those are ports basically from the port which is a door okay the door in and out of the device so the bridge has only two ports okay only two ports in and out in and out but the advantage of a bridge it understands the network flow because it understands the network flow it will be able to control the network traffic it won't be in promiscuous mode everything will pass in there no it will be able to tell that this signal will not pass through the bridge it is meant for this other side of the network this signal yes can pass through the bridge because it is meant for that computer on the other side of the bridge in that way, you find that computers can communicate simultaneously because they will be understood and they won't interfere with each other because the bridge will be there to control the traffic on the, on the network. Okay, so now, if you look at uh, the bridge, it's very good in terms of control, but very poor in terms of the number of devices it can connect. So what these scientists did, they had to bridge the advantages, okay? They had to take the advantages of a bridge, which is network control, and they had to take the advantages of a repeater, which is many ports or multiple ports. So now, a switch combines the advantages or the functionalities of a bridge and a switch. I mean, rather, and they were to repeat, rather. So now, a switch has many ports, the so-called multiple ports, multiple ports if you want, and then it is able to control network traffic. That's why as we speak right now, a switch, a packet switch, it's the most used in networks, more especially the wide area networks. Because wide area networks, one of the attributes, they are scalable, they're able to grow. They can allow okay, computers to communicate simultaneously. Now, what makes them do that is because they can connect many computers, they've got many ports, and they can control network traffic, okay? Scientifically speaking, a bridge, okay, a switch has a lot of bridged lines inside the technology inside the switch, okay, is a bridged line. So there are so many lines inside the switch which are bridged. So it makes a switch to be very, very useful for a wide area network. But as internet advances, okay, as internet advances, once again, there are so many protocols that have been introduced. Protocols 
are basically rules and regulations that controls how data should flow in a network. And as a programmer, you can basically call these, these are basically programs, instructions, which controls how machines should interact. So as we speak, there are so many programs or protocols that have been introduced. Now, a switch was not meant to understand these protocols. That's another weakness that was observed with the switch. It was unable to understand protocols. So instead, they introduced a switch-like device, but this switch-like device should be able to understand the, the protocols. So they just changed a switch into what you call router or a router. A router is basically a switch, but more advanced, okay? because it is able to understand the protocols that are on the internet. That's why other books, they call a, a router as a communication processor, okay? It's able to understand all these protocols that are on the internet, all right? So because of this, we've got two types of routers. Eh? We have what you call static router, and for what you call dynamic router, okay? As the name suggests, static router. <clears throat> These are routers which are configured manually. When you buy them, you have to configure them manually for them to save your purpose, for the purpose you want them to save. And then we have what you call dynamic routers, very intelligent. These are configured automatically. How? Because they're not human beings. How are they configured automatically? When they get on the network, they are in promiscuous mode, learning mode. So they will be learning all the packages or packets that will be flowing from one computer to the other computer. That way, they can learn the source addresses, they can learn the, the destination addresses, they can also then they can also have what you call temporal kind of reference. Okay, the spatial the kind of references. They will know which computers frequently communicate and on which side of the network. So in that way, they automatically come up with what you call a routine table. This routine table is the one that is used to control network traffic. If the computer A and B are communicating, so which channel are they going to use? Okay, which route are they going to use? What's the shortest distance to the destination? So a dynamic route is very, very intelligent. Okay, so it has been programmed in such a way that it can learn automatically the network and come up with a map. And this map is called a routine table. So even in terms of cost, a dynamic route is a bit, okay, let's just say it's expensive as compared to a static, router okay so what most companies do they will buy a switch for internal connectivity okay internal connectivity that is the local area network they'll buy a switch now if they want to have connectivity outside you want to to link their local area network to the internet that's when they will have the router doing that job. A router will have data go outside and come in because they can understand the outside world better than the switch. So the router will understand and feed the switch, the information that can be used locally within an organization. So now if you are told, how do you set up, how do you make this organization or this school of internet? First thing first, let that school set up a local area network. So if computers are connected within the institution, then you can actually have a router which will be linking the local area network to the outside world. That's how networks are set up, okay? But due to what you call ad hoc, okay, networking, wireless communication, we've got, uh, 
the wireless routers. Okay, the so-called MIFIs now, we have them. Now, these ones, they can actually connect computers without cabling, okay, without the cables, linking the computers in the organization using cables. Straight away from the same router, you can configure, you can create a wireless network, what you call YLAN, eh? wireless local area network within the organization, which would be connected to the internet. So the Apple network makes things easy because they can actually do two things at a time, at a time. That is creating a local area network and also connecting to the outside world. So saving the company, buying cables to link the computers in the organization and buying a router that will link these computers to the outside world. Again, from experience, most organizations, they, they will prefer having a wired, okay, a wired local ADA network as opposed to a wireless local ADA network. Because a wired local ADA network makes the connectivity very strong and very, very fast. So it depends with the needs of an organization. Okay. Now let's talk about the publics, a public, private, okay? The private branch exchange, publics. The private branch exchange. So this is the device which switches calls within an organization. I think you've seen most organizations, they will, they will list one communication line from the communication providers, like in our case, Zamtel, Airtel, any other communication provider. And then within the organization, they are going to split that line into different offices, of which within the organization, you're able to communicate clearly, right? But if you want to communicate to the outside world, okay, outside the organization, you need to pass through this list channel you have. Okay, so find that in each and every office there are transceivers, eh? the transceivers. Okay, these uh, mobile lines, eh? they are there. So if you want to communicate, call someone in another office, just press five, you call someone or press two, you call human resource manager, or press five, you call another HOD that side. Yeah, those are made possible because of the, the private branch exchange, which switches calls, right? So you can see that even in data communication with networks, we have got such devices which multiplex and demultiplex signals within the organization so that you can easily what? Communicate without difficulties okay so basically in summary we have just discussed the repeater the bridge the switch the router and the publics and if you have noticed from the repeater to a router we have seen improvements so the improvement of a repeater is a bridge the improvement of a repeat and the bridge is a switch, okay? The improvement of a switch is a router. So these devices, these telecommunication devices you're talking about, they come about by observing the current devices and make modifications to these current devices or completely come up with a new device or together because of the current needs. So now when we migrate from IP version 4 fully to IP version 6, we are going to see uh, new telecommunication devices on the market. So speaking of the multiplexing and demultiplexing of the signals, I would like the next time that you meet in this subject, we discuss the signal division, eh? the signal division. Under this, we'll look at these divisions, the frequency division multiplexing, and we'll look at the, the code division multiplexing, and we'll look at the time division multiplexing. When time allows, 
we can also move on and discuss what you call MAC, network MAC, medium access control. Okay, I think this is how far we can go for now. So we'll meet next time and discuss other issues. Right?